Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, 10 years later, why young people are picking up the bill for the global financial crisis. Also this week, the weakest links, fears over a seismic economic event that could be brewing in emerging markets. Plus, behind gated walls, the growing wealth divide and the housing market. This week, we're marking an important anniversary. Ten years ago, on September 15th, Wall Street bank Lehman Brothers collapsed. But this event wasn't about a 150-year-old bank. Lehman was a key part of a chain reaction, one which ultimately threatened to unravel the global financial system. Banks across the US had been offering housing loans to people with bad credit for years, so-called subprime mortgages. And this is where things got complicated. Those loans were packaged into risky products and sold onto global institutions. Regulators were asleep at the wheel and huge risks were taken. Lehman triggered widespread panic over fears that the system was riddled with bad debt. Credit dried up and banks stopped lending to each other. Governments had to bail out banks and enact emergency measures. Taxpayers' money was pumped into the global financial system to keep it alive. The loss of confidence in the system led to a global recession and a huge collapse in consumer wealth. The after-effects are still being felt today. So what's actually changed since, you may ask? Well, global growth has recovered since the great financial crisis and the recession that followed. The world is on track for 3.9% growth in 2018, according to the IMF. But that recovery is very uneven. We've seen a decade of record low interest rates and new rules and regulations to shore up the banking system. But the emergency measures used to stimulate the economy and bring it back to life have been in use for much longer than intended. Quantitative easing, or government buying of assets, helped to preserve wealth for those that had it. But young people today can't afford to acquire assets. That wealth gap is on the increase. Globally, total debt is now worse than before the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Those record low interest rates in the developed world meant that it was cheaper for developing nations or emerging markets to borrow in dollars or euros. And we're now entering an era in which central banks like the US Federal Reserve aren't keeping rates low anymore. And that's lending support to the dollar. So as the dollar rises, it's now costing those emerging markets a lot more to repay their debts. And what about Wall Street? Well, stock markets have tripled in value since the crisis, but it's tech stocks which have replaced financials as the new masters of the universe. So if another crisis is brewing, where will it come from? Al Jazeera's Scott Heidler reports from Hangzhou, where part of China's massive shadow banking system has recently faced a crisis of its own, and some aspects are similar to what happened in 2008. At 32, Zhang Zhou focuses all her attention on building her wealth. This motivation, she says, comes from growing up with very little. Money is very, very important to me because money can bring me the sense of security. I don't want to live poor again. Living in Hangzhou, Zhang Zhou embodies the entrepreneurial spirit in the city known for its financial technology industry and home to e-commerce giant Alibaba. But she and millions of other people in China have lost billions of dollars after investing in what are known as peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms, or P2P. Amid stricter government oversight and the panic withdrawal of funds by investors, more than 200 firms have failed in the last three months. P2P firms gather money from investors and then lend money to small businesses and individuals, with many promising high returns on those investments. And that concerns economists, as the P2P industry in China is the world's largest, with more than $190 billion at play. This on the 10th anniversary of the global financial crisis. For the debt problem, I think it's a hidden bomb in China for a long time. But now it looks especially dangerous because a lot of, a lot of those debts are tied to the property market. And uh, uh, like the recent P2P crisis, uh, much of the borrowing or used to finance and their housing market speculation. 
And she says some aspects of P2P lending are similar to the subprime loans in the U.S. that led to the 2008 global financial crisis. The outcry over the failing P2P companies was so big in July that the government here in Hangzhou had to use athletic stadiums to house the complaint centers for the thousands of investors looking to get their money back or simply find out where it went. Some of those who lost money took their anger to the offices of one P2P firm, protesting out front, chanting, we want our money back. Joining us now from London is Russell Jones. Russell's an economist and partner at Llewellyn Consulting, an independent uh, economics uh, advisory firm. Russell, great to have you with us again on, on Counting the Cost. Now, you were at Lehman Brothers 10 years ago. Is this financial crisis over? Because a lot of young people feel that they're still paying for it. I think there are still some issues that need to be handled. Um, my sense is that although the financial system, the international financial system, is a lot safer than it was in 2007, or at least, should we say, it's better equipped to deal with the sort of crisis which began in 2007 and 2008, there are still some, some outstanding problems, not least in the area of, uh, of economic policy. Uh, I think that we are overly dependent upon monetary policy. Uh, if you like, the mix of fiscal and monetary policy is still too skewed uh, in favour of what central banks have to do. I think that there's been a, a lot of uh, shortcomings where structural or supply-side policy is concerned, and that's left us with a lower potential rate of growth in the advanced economies. And I also am concerned that there is a, an element of backtracking on some of the financial sector reforms in the United States. And this is uh, something that we see quite often, the desire to reform the financial sector after a crisis uh, tends to wane the longer we are into the recovery, the sort of a, a pro-cyclicality, if you like. And again, you can see that in some of the things that the Trump administration has done recently. Gordon Brown was Britain's prime minister 10 years ago. On Thursday, he said that we're sleepwalking into the next crisis, that the world is not ready to deal with another crisis. Is he right? I think uh, what Mr Brown said has, has more than a grain of truth in it. Uh, we still have an awful lot of uh, private sector debt in the world economy, which was one of the imbalances which, which was uh, playing out uh, the last financial crisis. There's still a lot of debt. I think another point that Mr. Brown made, which I would certainly agree with, is that the uh, cooperation between the major economies uh, is really under a great deal of pressure at the moment. Um, Mr. Trump has launched quite an attack on the international financial institutions, and it was through the guise of those international financial institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, and so on, the OECD, that a lot of the policy measures uh, that were taken at the debt for the crisis uh, were, were conducted through or with the help of. And we're now in an environment where there's a lot more bilateralism, there's a lot less multilateralism. As I say, the Americans, the most powerful economy in the world still, their government is, if anything, undermining these international institutions. And that is extremely troubling. Was it Warren Buffett who said, uh, you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide uh, goes out? Um, and, and to quote Buffett again, uh, where are the new weapons of, of, of mass destruction? Emerging markets? Could a whole country fail? I'm thinking about Ar Argentina and its problems. Well, there's no doubt that the emerging markets now are increasingly important. They account for more than, than half of global GDP. Uh, and it's also the case that the Chinese economy, which has a huge amount of outstanding debt, is increasingly important. Uh, it, it's actually been a good thing over the last nine years. It's, it's grown very fast, and that's helped to, to, uh, to bring the, the world economy out of, uh, out of what was effectively a depression. But it is vulnerable. It has this debt problem. There are underlying tensions between the uh, sort of capitalist economic system and the, the communist political system in China, which haven't gone away. And as you said, there are other emerging market economies which are in deep trouble. Argentina, Brazil, Turkey, um, I, I'd even go as far as South Africa and maybe even some of the smaller countries like Egypt, Pakistan and so on. 
Um, so we have to be concerned about those. And in some of those economies, the politics which are playing out are really not conducive to the right sort of policy response. And there, in particular, I'm thinking about the, the imminent elections in Brazil and Argentina and the political situation in Turkey, where you have a president who doesn't seem to want to take on board any of the conventional economic wisdom. And that's a worry. Russell, you talk about the, the troubling levels of uh, high levels of, uh, of personal debt uh, that, that we've seen. How do you go about fixing the inequality that the last 10 years, the financial crisis, has led to? I'm thinking about, uh, in particular, young people uh, who can't get on the, the, the housing market, for instance, with, with huge student loans that they've got to pay off over the course of their working lives. I think there have to be some really innovative responses to this. I mean, income inequality, wealth inequality, are huge issues. And as you hinted, there is a, increasingly an intergenerational element to this, with the young feeling that they're getting very much uh, the thin end of the wedge, as it were. Uh, I think politicians are going to have to be uh, agile, innovative. Um, my sense is that the way to look at this is that we need to become more interventionist. That doesn't mean that we have to abandon the sort of capitalist model which has, notwithstanding the crises we experience, uh, has been so successful for so many centuries. But in order to make that capitalist model work and work well, we're going to have to redistribute more, and we're going to have to think of some, uh, some new ways of doing that. Uh, my sense is that higher taxation on the wealthy is, is unavoidable. My sense is that more transfers from pensioners back into the younger generations is unavoidable. We are going to have to do this. Otherwise, the political environment we face, which is already, let's face it, pretty fraught, is going to become even more unpleasant and even more difficult to deal with. I would say that addressing in income inequality uh, is something which will help to save the current system rather than undermine it. We're now in the era of the trillion-dollar company. What are the dangers uh, when you've got uh, companies like Amazon and Apple uh, who, who, are, who are worth more than, than a, lot of, a lot of the world's economies? Already you're seeing this ability of them to uh, escape the taxation net in different uh, jurisdictions, generate political problems, political criticisms. These are entities which are now hugely powerful. And this is a brave new world. And I think this is, again, another example where the authorities, whether it's the tax authorities or, or the regulatory authorities, are consistently having to play catch up as these new entities develop and innovate and so on. Russell, really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Thank you. All right, still to come on Counting the Cost. I'm Lawrence Lee in Berlin, where 10 years after the financial crash, the German economy continues to go from strength to strength. But at what cost to other European countries? Now, while the great financial crisis was playing out on Wall Street and in government ministries, its roots lay in small towns and cities across the US. Families pursuing the dream of home ownership fell victim to unscrupulous banks and predatory lending schemes. Al Jazeera's Rob Reynolds reports from Paris in California. Oh, wait, this is a one. Just before the crash, life was good for Betty Nicanor, her parents, and her kids. They'd recently bought a brand new house. Our house was just huge. It was a really big house. It had uh, five bedrooms, four bathrooms. All of that, it, it just seemed so perfect. But the dream house proved to be a cruel illusion. A salesman had convinced her father, Maynardo, to sign an adjustable rate mortgage on a property worth $750,000. But the family's income was only $60,000 a year. In 2008 and 2009, the area's housing prices plummeted, like they did nationwide. And their home payments rose higher and higher. Unable to make the monthly payments, they reached out to their bank. We tried to refinance, they wouldn't help us. Three weeks later, Minardo lost his job, and the dream house was sold. What was the home worth by then? Uh, 330. You bought it at $750,000. Yes. yes. And it was worth less than half yes. of that. Yes, yes. The family wound up nearly broke, with their credit ruined. I work in hard for 
three years, I lost everything. This area of California, Riverside County, was one of the hardest hit during the housing collapse and the recession. It had the third highest rate of home foreclosures in the entire U.S. Fabian Casares' organization helps low-income people with home ownership. It was chaos here. We were ground zero. The market was just, you know, upside down here. Uh, it was, it was, it was chaos. It was total chaos, and you know, it took years to get out of it. And I was there, and I still dare to say that we're still in it. The Nicanors struggled to get back on their feet. My mom was the one who took it the hardest. She went into depression. You know, my dad was just like broken in two. He was like, you know, I can't believe this happened to us. Gloria Nicanor suffered a series of strokes and heart attacks. And earlier this year, Maynardo Nicanor was diagnosed with colon cancer. He's had surgery and has to wear a portable chemotherapy pump. But he continues to work every day. The Nicanors have saved some money and are now in the process of buying a modest house nearby, a step towards security after a decade of pain. Joining us now from Canberra, Australia, is Tim Reardon. Tim's the principal economist with the Housing Industry Association there. Tim, good to have you with us on Counting the Cost. So, 10 years this week since the collapse of Lehman Brothers, triggered, of course, by uh, the U.S. subprime mortgage crisis. Um, in the 10 years since, we've managed to save Wall Street. What's been done to save the housing market, though? Is there still such a thing as subprime? Is it any easier now or harder to get a mortgage if you are a lower-income earner? Could it all happen again? I, I think it's very unlikely that it could happen again. But certainly the, the global financial crisis, the, the, the precursor to that, the failure of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the subprime lenders in the United States, uh, they've certainly given us the greatest economic shock we've seen at least since the oil crisis in the 1970s and quite possibly longer. It's, it's going to leave an indelible mark on both economic history books and global history books um, for its impact on society and uh, the economy. There have been enormous changes globally in terms of lending practices. The United States uh, has severely changed the way in which their derivative markets operate. We've seen uh, global multinational agreements come into place which have uh, ensured that uh, countries are operating much better uh, from a regulatory perspective to ensure that there aren't uh, the derivative trading practices that were occurring back uh, 10, 15 years ago that led to uh, the global financial crisis. So I think the risks to the economy going forward are very different. Um, I don't think that subprime market, that, that issue is not going to arise again. We've learnt our lesson from that uh, overly free uh, lending practices. But the medicine, Tim, that we used to fix the crisis was poison for a whole generation of people who now can no longer afford uh, to buy assets, to get on to the, uh, the, the housing crisis. This, uh, the housing ladder, sorry, this is where uh, inequality, I suppose, is, is most visible. How do you fix that inequality? Yes, yeah, so there has been a structural change there. Those that uh, own prior to 2007 uh, in, in global markets have certainly had an advantage. Um, but that, that will correct over time. It is correcting over time. Um, from a government regulatory perspective, um, we're starting to see, uh, the, for, for the first time really since the Second World War, um, global money supply starting to tighten from what has been an incredibly lax position. Um, so uh, from, from a regulatory perspective, from a government perspective, there's certainly a role they have to play there to ensure that first-home buyers, uh, young people, low-income earners have a place in the housing market. You can see that through uh, practices um, in, in different countries. The build to rent market in a variety of different countries is uh, transitioning into other models that allow uh, owners to either lease land, rent land, uh, or purchase their house through other mechanisms. Um, that's not the same as the, the subprime market that we saw prior to 2007. Um, and there's a variety of different, different mechanisms there that governments have pursued. Tim, really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Thanks for being with us. Pleasure. Thank you for your time. A new report says that more than 40 million Americans are struggling to pay for enough food month to month. Now, while that is a small improvement on recent years, it still means that many people are forced to rely on handouts. Al Jazeera's Kristen Salumi has been to visit a food bank in New York. Martina Santos volunteers at this food pantry in Manhattan, where once a week she makes lunch for all the staff. This is like a bread pudding, what I made it last night in my house. 
This time, in addition to bread pudding, it's beef, chicken, or pork with vegetables and beans. But like many other volunteers here, Martina also relies on the pantry herself to help feed her family of four. She's what's known as food insecure, which means she struggles to pay for all the food her family needs. It's important for me because they're helping me to put the food on the table, you know? When I'm running out, I come in over here. I got meat, I got rice, I got beans, and I got some fresh vegetable, fruits and vegetables. The pantry is run by the West Side Campaign Against Hunger, which allows low-income families to come once a month to get three days' worth of groceries. Although it's based in the affluent Upper West Side of Manhattan, it sees customers from all five boroughs of New York City. A lot of the people who rely on food pantries like this one don't qualify for federal assistance, what's known as SNAP or food stamps. So even as the number of food insecure people in the United States has gone down, their reliance on places like this has remained high. Two thirds of our customers are exclusively Spanish speaking. Um, and many of them are recent immigrants and um, are not able to access some of the federal benefits that help to keep families afloat. And so they are increasingly leaning on places like here to meet their family's basic needs. According to the group Hunger Free America, it's a common misperception that people who rely on food assistance don't work. Uh, in the last few decades, the number of private charities in America has absolutely skyrocketed, yet the number of people hungry has skyrocketed. Why? Because we've replaced living wage jobs with poverty jobs, and we've slashed a government safety net. Making the work these charities do essential, if not a solution to the problem. Finally this week, 10 years after the financial crash of 2008, Germany still stands accused of helping to wreck the Greek economy by demanding punitive austerity measures. But inside the German government, there's no remorse, as Lawrence Lee reports from Berlin. In the corridors of power in Berlin, there are reasons to be cheerful. 10 years ago, the German economy was so well insulated that a big crash was never going to cause a crisis. So much has changed in other European countries, but not here. In the first six months of this year alone, the German economy ran a budget surplus of over $50 billion. That's almost 3% of Germany's gross domestic product or annual wealth. It's the kind of figure that makes other countries either extremely jealous or absolutely furious. It was the German government that demanded, after the bank started to fall, that the European Commission impose new rules on countries like Greece, forcing them to adopt hugely destructive tax-raising powers in return for bailouts and loans. A decade on, stagnant economies and huge unemployment levels are what's left. The proceeds went to the banks, not the people. Many economists hold Germany directly responsible for bankrupting Greece. It is a very anti-democratic approach, but it is something that gives assurance to German politicians that there are rules and that they can be uh, adhered to and that things will work out. But um, I think that kind of Comfort is illusionary. In its defense, Germany would argue that if other countries had behaved in the right way in the first place, then there wouldn't have been a problem. Most of the political class here bears few regrets about driving policies which proved so controversial. No, absolutely not. I think that was the only way. The fact that we are successful in all these countries uh, shows that this was the right way. And it's like in the, it's like in the private uh, sphere. Um, if you don't have debt, you are a free man. And if you ha have debt, um, you have to listen to uh, the, the persons who gave you the money. The one area which Germany has suffered from in recent years has been the rise of far-right populism, born partly from economics in poor areas, but also from anger towards Chancellor Merkel's generous asylum policies for refugees. This week, though, the German government announced it was devoting billions of euros to tackle long-term unemployment, a certain way of diffusing anger. Germany is able to make these choices in ways others can only dream about. And that is our show for this week. If you want to get in touch with us and comment on anything you've seen, you can tweet me. I'm at A. Finnegan on Twitter. Please use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or you can drop us a line. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our email address. As always, there's plenty more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page. There you'll find individual reports, links, even entire episodes for you to catch up on. 
But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.